maybe uh, you wish to tell us in a few minutes the nature of their discoveries. <clears throat> I'd be happy to, but and you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, the date on here I was just noticing is um, 14 August 1978, which was just about six weeks after we discovered the fact that Pluto has a satellite. Once you have a satellite for a planet, you can determine how heavy it is. It turns out Pluto was very much smaller and lighter weight than we had thought, which meant that Pluto has no influence, no appreciable influence on the motions of the planets Uranus and Neptune. At that point, we voiced a hypothesis that this means that there is at least one yet-to-be-discovered planet in the outer reaches of the solar system, and this naturally led directly to you and, and your interest in what we're doing, and that's when you, you sent me this book. You have then postulated the existence or, or the appearance in some, some, some time eons ago uh, of, of a, a celestial body which you, I think, named in that uh, paper uh, an intruder, yes. which may have uh, collided with or, or, or somehow uh, turned on, on their side both Uranus and Pluto. Uh, it did a lot more than that, as a matter of fact. In that paper, we hypothesized that this intruder passed very close to Neptune, that it dislodged one of what we then think were many satellites of Neptune, and one of them became the planet Pluto. We actually think Pluto was an escaped satellite of Neptune. This will also take the orbit of Triton, the big satellite of Neptune, and reverse it. We'll take the orbit of the satellite near Reed and extend it outwards. We can produce all of the observed aspects of the satellite system of Neptune plus Pluto's orbit just with this one single intruding planet. Now, one of the things we, we did in 1978, having made this prediction that there was a, an additional planet, 10th or 12th, depending on your point of view, but it's the, the next one, um, we sort of put our money where our mouth was, as it were, and we went out and we started looking for this thing. In the, We've been searching for 12 years for this thing. We've been able to refine the search area somewhat, um, get it rather narrowed down. We, we do our predictions based on the observed anomalies in Uranus and Neptune. We actually are currently looking down in the region of Centaurus, which is just south of the, of the constellation Libra, but very close to the area that you've talked about. I think, uh, Dr. Harrington, you have a pretty good picture at least in your own mind of what we're talking about, a big planet, a small planet. Uh. Well, if, if it is in the kind of orbit that we describe here, it would have to be a planet that would have a mass something like three to five times the mass of the Earth. This would put it uh, intermediate between the gaseous planets like Uranus and Neptune and the terrestrial planets that we, we have in the inner part of the solar system. So if if this planet turns out to be in a 3,600-year orbit, then its, its mass will be correspondingly larger. But we're talking about something that's it's a perfectly reasonable kind of planet. It looks like a good, nice planet, uh, small enough that it's not going to be completely enveloped in gas, so it's perfectly capable of supporting uh, life forms of one kind or another. This one here is a map of the solar system as we know it. Uh, the inner planets, this is the orbit of planet Pluto, and this here is the orbit that I have proposed for uh, the tenth planet, and here's where we think it is right about now in its orbit. This is your orbit for the planet, and the, um, showing that it would come out of Sagittarius in the biblical time, and that once you allow for precession, it would be around into Libra by now, and, uh, which is, again, approximately the area that we're looking in.